Welcome back to the What's Next for Impact podcast. I'm Meg Starr, Global Head of Impact at Carlisle, and I'm joined by my colleague, Cara Helander, who's Carlisle's Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer. Thanks so much for joining, Cara. It's great to be here, Meg. Cara, to kick off, can you just tell us a little bit about what your role is and what you look over at Carlisle? Absolutely. Um, I have a great role. My role is in working to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion for Carlisle itself, but also for our portfolio companies, which is a really exciting role because this issue, we're learning more and more about it, about the impact it can have and how it can drive performance. And so I get to do really interesting work every day. That's amazing. I I know we've driven a lot of important initiatives around diversity, both at Carlisle and as you point out across our portfolio companies, but I wanna hone in first on the why. Why is it that building a diverse and inclusive culture should be top of mind for business leaders? Yeah, it fundamentally boils down to this is really about being competitive in the 21st century. You know, in a business environment that's increasingly global, interconnected, fast paced, um, diversity, we need the advantage that diverse, equitable and inclusive teams can offer. And there's an abundance of research from very world-class, credible organizations that demonstrate the link between diversity, diverse teams, and better performance on a whole host of measures. And we have evidence within our own portfolio that is in alignment with that. We looked at the boards of our portfolio companies and found that those companies that have diverse boards have average annual earnings growth that's 12% higher. So this is really about value creation, a mechanism to really make sure that our companies are equipped to create the highest amount of value that they possibly can. I'd also note that the really fascinating studies, for example, by BCG, that looked at the what they called innovation revenue. And this was revenue that was generated from products or services that had been introduced in the previous three years. And what they found was those companies that have more diverse management teams had higher innovation revenue. So this is really an important ingredient to, to performance. And so that's why we're very focused on it, in addition to obviously the important moral and social impact of this work. It's clear the reasons why the diversity has ratcheted up the agenda for corporate leaders in the past few years. But I'd love to talk about like, what have we learned in that time? I know a lot of progress has been made, but there are a lot of areas where there's still work to do. Could, could you walk us through a little bit of that learning and the path forward? Yeah, so I think there's been a ton of learning and much more that we need to learn, but I would say a couple of things. One that this is something that you just can't hope will change if we continue with the same behaviors that we have in the past. What that means is that you need to be intentional in your efforts. I think the other thing we've learned is that it is very powerful, and in fact, it's critical that this be led from the top. Um, That kind of credible stewardship and governance is really important. You know, our own CEO, Q Song Lee, is the chair of Carla's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Council. And the heads of all of our major funds and functions globally sit on that council. And the third thing you need is you need to have metrics and accountability. Metrics so that you know where you are and where you can take the most effective action to drive improvement and accountability so that people know that this matters. You're both rewarding and you're holding people accountable to drive change on this. I think the final thing I would say that we've learned is it has to be embedded in your strategy. Um, So it has to be seen as a driver of business performance. We often talk with our portfolio companies about starting with the compelling why. How is this going to help you to improve your, the, the capabilities of your workforce? How is it going to help you tap new markets or new customer bases? Um, how is it going to help you address innovation challenges that you might have, particularly if you're a business that's very dependent on innovation to drive continued growth? So those are really important elements that 
are foundational to, to driving progress on this over time in a, in a strong and sustainable way. That's incredible. And I, I want to hone in on one particular point you made there around accountability. Why is that so important? And more importantly, how are companies actually embedding accountability into their corporate structures? Yeah, so it's it's really important because, as I said, sometimes making change around diversity, equity, and inclusion requires people to change behavior. They have to do things in a different way. And so that's where the compelling why comes in. But that's also where having systems of accountability are really important because it is showing people that you value this. Um, you're going to measure, you know, you, there's a classic saying, we measure what matters. Um, and it applies to this as well. But I think, you know, one of the things I can tell you is at Carlisle, Last year, we introduced the DEI Incentive Awards. And this was an important way for us to recognize people within the firm who've gone above and beyond to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so we awarded 54 people $2 million, the total of $2 million to 54 people um, to recognize their efforts. And what was really unique about this is individuals were selected based on being nominated by their peers. Um, and so we were able to surface actions that were happening across the organization that were very, very powerful, sometimes not obvious or immediately visible, um, but that served as a way of both signaling our intent, but also surfacing great practices that other colleagues could then emulate. That's amazing. And I, I feel like those in incentive programs and more so the recognition and, and telling of those stories is so important for embedding it culturally. Yes. And another dimension of this is, is the, the data piece, which you've mentioned. mentioned. And, and I, I'm curious how you think about data in this space. What, what KPIs should companies be thinking about? Which ones might be you know, a little bit off the beaten track, but that are really helpful indicators of, kind of cultural progress on these issues? Yeah. So look, data, I, I think first and foremost, metrics and data, um, they are means to an end. They are not the end themselves. What we're really driving toward is using that as a tool to help create both the kind of diverse workforce that we want to achieve and the kind of culture that brings out the best in that diversity. Um, so when we think about metrics, there are the outcome metrics or the lagging indicators, but there's also the leading indicators that are really important to focus on. Um, so what are those kinds of leading indicators? They're, they're measures of behavior change. So for example, the percentage of interview slates that have at least two diverse professionals who are interviewed, or the percentage of in professionals from underrepresented groups who have a mentor or a sponsor. So these are steps, measuring steps that will actually help drive change on those ultimate outcome measures like representation or hiring. Um, and that's important because this change on this takes time. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're engaging and measuring the right behaviors that are going to lead to those ultimate better outcomes. So my, my next question relates to this topic of data because it's actually undergirded by our ability to have these metrics. But one area that's been really exciting for Carlisle has been in the space of ESG-linked financings and particularly those tied to diversity targets. Could you walk us through one of these structures and, and the origins of, of how did we get started in this space? Yes, absolutely. So let me give you a little bit of the background on that. In, in February of 2020, we set a goal to have 30% of the seats in our controlled portfolio companies globally held by diverse professionals by 2023. Um, and at the time, we were at 16%. Now, we've made amazing progress towards that goal. We now today have 29% of the seats in our controlled companies globally held by diverse professionals. The lines of credit are a really important tool that we've used to help 
accelerate change on that goal. Um, and basically what we've done is established over $8 billion in lines of credit in Europe, Asia, and the US, where our cost of borrowing is tied to hitting certain metrics, certain progress against that board diversity goal. Um, and, you know, in some cases, in some of these lines of credit, it is solely tied to board diversity. In other, in other cases, it's one of a number of ESG factors that help to trigger that reduction in our cost of borrowing. But they become very helpful motivators, as I said, to accelerate change. I love that idea of how do we keep structuring in this convergence between profitability and progress on, on these topics. Exactly. And another area that, that Carlisle has really innovated on is I know earlier this year we launched the DEI Leadership Network. This is really, as I understand it, a coalition of portfolio company CEOs around the globe to give them a peer group where they can have honest discussions and share learnings and insights and in what they're wrestling with. Can you share how this initiative kind of got started and, and, and what the purpose is for our portfolio company CEOs? Absolutely. Well, it, it got started because we saw an increasing um, level of request for insight and support from our portfolio company CEOs. Um, and so we wanted to respond to that with a some insights, some tools, and a forum where they could support one another. Um, so as we all know, the job of a CEO is very lonely um, and the expectations on leading on DEI have gotten much higher, more complex. And so we see this network as a way of giving our CEOs access to experts in DE and I, some concrete tools that they can use, but again, more importantly, the opportunity to share insights with one another. Um, I'll also mention that we've created a DEI playbook for our portfolio companies. Again, with insight, tools, guidance, frameworks for how to start and drive change on DEI within your organization. Um, and that's something that many of our portfolio companies have really appreciated. Again, having having some tools to begin this journey with or to continue advancing on the journey if they've been on it for a while. That's amazing. And, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about where this field has been and what CEOs and management teams are wrestling with today. But for the last question, I'd love to talk about where the field is going. And, and in particular, once management teams really have their DEI efforts underway, how do they maintain momentum and how do they keep it going? Uh, that's a great question. Um, one is to recognize that this is something that is a long game. Um, and what that means is that you need to lead from the top. You need to embed this in everything that you do. It's not just about one program or one initiative. It's really about thinking about how this impacts all of your, your processes, your customers, not you know, your, your, who you're buying supports and services from. But it is really important to recognize that change, you're leading change. And so that, again, reiterating the why becomes really important. Measuring and refining your strategy. And very importantly, knowing that, you know, reframing setbacks is temporary and learning from them and continuing to move forward. You know, one of the things that we often hear from executives is they feel almost hesitant to start because where they, they're not proud of where their starting point is. Um, and we simply try to encourage them to say, it doesn't matter what your starting point is. It's really about taking steps to pr improve. And so that's what we try to encourage. That, that, uh, that's what we say a lot in ESG land, I feel, that we're focused on progress, not perfection. And it's about how do you take that first step forward. Exactly. Well, Cara, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of What's Next for Impact, and in particular, helping us think through what's next for building diverse and inclusive teams. Um, thank you a lot and looking forward to the next episode. Thank you.